Hi everybody and welcome to Alan History Nerd. This video is looking at the UK Constitution, in particular debates on extending reform. Now I've looked at one of the major debates on this in a separate video where I've looked at the arguments about whether Britain should have a codified and entrenched constitution. This video is picking up on some of those other key debates which might well form the basis of the type of questions you might get asked in an A-level politics exam. So this is part of my A-level politics playlist uh, and in this playlist I am aiming to cover the whole of the A-level spec as I teach it. So this comes from the Edexcel specification uh, for component 2 1.4 debates on further reform. As I said I've already I've done a separate video on one of the big debates on this which is on the codified and entrenched constitution. The other bits say that we should look at a, a, an overview of the extent to which individual reforms since 97 uh, listed in section 1.2, and I'll, I'll, I'll give the, you those in a second, uh, should be taken further, and the extent to which uh, devolution should be extended in England. So that bit on, on 1.2 is under Labour 97 to 2010, House of Lords reforms, electoral reforms, devolution, Human Rights Act and the Supreme Court. Under the Coalition Government 2010 to 2015, uh, Fixed Term Parliament Act, uh, further devolution in Wales. And then some um, further action taken since 2015, including further devolution in Scotland, um, the Scottish independence uh, referendum, and then obviously the big one that's happened since then, which has been Brexit. Now, I'm going to go through some of these reforms uh, one by one and, and look at, at some of the issues about whether there is need for greater change or not, and, and give an idea of where we are and the likelihood of it. So on Lord's reform, well, there's essentially two sides to the argument. On one side, you've got the everything is fine argument saying there's no need for further reform uh, because now we've we've got rid of a simple form of uh, of um, membership based on inheritance. You can't you no longer kind of heredit have hereditary peers in the same way. So the Lords now, we, is, the people in the House of Lords are there on merit, arguably. Uh, the Lords has played a key role in the hold, holding the government to account in recent issues, particularly over uh, issues during the whole Brexit debates. And so you could argue that there is little to gain from having a second chamber of elected politicians and this because this would simply mirror the House of Commons and it would just make things more confusing and, and actually cause more problems than it would solve. The counter argument to that and so the, the one that says yes we need more change is that fundamentally the House of Lords is undemocratic because it's unelected. Uh, the, the Royal Commission under Lord Wakeham um, recommended um, some reforms, including uh, elected members, up to 195 of the 550 Lords, which it's the, the Wakeham's report uh, suggested limiting the, the Lords to. It is currently uh, the second biggest legislative body in the world. And this is back in 2000. But those recommendations have not been enacted. And, and so the, the Labour government um, at the time didn't carry them out. They have not been done by either the coalition or the Conservative government since. Now, there's a strong argument that the weakness of the House of Lords causes a real problem in, in, the, in the UK system, because essentially there's this argument we have an elected dictatorship, that if you win the majority in the House of Commons, and really there's nothing in your path to stop you doing whatever you want. And so there is a strong need for, for a, a, an upper chamber, which has actually got some teeth, so it can actually counter this, so it can stop the government in the House of Commons just doing whatever it wants. It also offers a good chance of feeding into one of the other topics, which is, is for a, a electoral reform. So if you don't want to change first past the post in the House of Commons, well, if you created an elected House of Lords, then to stop it mirroring, which is one of the arguments given above, to stop it mirroring the, the House of Commons, then you just elect it using a different system. So, for example, if the House of Lords had a proportionate system, then it would ha it would not mirror the House of Commons because you would have a different spread in terms of its membership. And that therefore could act as a balance, a bit like uh, the, the Senate acts as a balance on the, the House of Congress. They're elected in two different ways in America. So all of this could work to give a, a, a kind of more balanced government, something where where the uh, there was greater oversight, greater scrutiny of what a government was doing, it potentially co could cause, however this feeds into the other argument, it could cause a degree of gridlock. 
Another area that where we saw constitutional reform was in the area of human rights. Well, the position of the Human Rights Act is, is, is currently um, not 100% clear uh, following the Brexit um, the, the Brexit idea. So we've, we've now got in, from the Conservative Manifesto, they spoke about creating a British Bill of Rights, um, which would mean that the UK Supreme Court, not the European Court of Human Rights, was the final court on appeal. And, and on this, you could go, well, we had a Human Rights Act, which was enshrined in essentially in European law, and then it had European courts holding it up at the end. And now we're going to have human rights held up in a British bill, uh, and it's going to be upheld by British courts. So we not, not a huge amount wrong with either of those, actually, and, and we can all feel that that's great. The counter argument to that is that I think it's just enshrined in British law means it's just going to be an act of parliament. Well, no act of parliament is, is necessarily binding on future parliaments or isn't binding on future parliaments. Therefore, it could be revoked, altered, removed, got rid of. And they're all, then all your rights are gone and there's no other defence of that. And so in that, there is an argument that we need some kind of enshrining of it. Now, it's difficult to see how you could enshrine that without going to one of the things which is in the other debate, which is the idea of an entrenched codified constitution. Electoral reform is an area where there's a great deal of controversy and um, a great deal of strong views. Now, recent elections have seen the results skewed by first past the post. So, for example, our current government um, won about 43 percent of the vote and got a, a huge majority, majority of 80. So minority of the votes, majority of the seats. So you can see things are still being skewed by first past the post. And this has worked particularly in the favour of two parties, the Conservative Party and the SNP. So those two parties obviously are not going to be particularly um, keen on further electoral reform, most notably and most importantly for us, the Conservative Party, because they're in government. Um, now, you can argue the last few elections have all been a bit odd because of the whole thing with the, the, the Brexit crisis. Uh, and, and therefore, we've had new parties in UKIP and then the Brexit party. And therefore, we had them where they didn't have a traditional voter base, but they, they picked up loads of votes and, and those votes were spread out. And so they, those votes weren't represented in in seats. But we continue to see, for example, the party that argues most strongly for electoral reform, the Liberal Democrats, who, who gained a huge amount of, of votes in the last election and actually lost a seat. So they went they went from um, three, they, they went up to about over three million votes. So they gained about a million votes and lost a seat. The Conservative Party um, gained uh, gained a lot less, uh, gained about the same and, and uh, went up to have a huge majority. So it, 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 the system arguably is is unfair. Now, there are, there are, however, the merits to it, and lots of people argue that they, they, they like it and they like the strong government that it brings. Now, there is an increasing degree of dissent in it. So we've seen Nigel Farage now the Brexit stuff has, has gone over and, and he's been distracted a bit by um, stuff on lockdown. But he's, he's talked about a new reform party and in that uh, essentially echoing the ideas that the Liberal Dems have been, the Dems have been standing for for years in terms of re reforming the, the voting system, also reforming the House of Lords, which is something else I've looked at. Keir Starmer and Labour seem to be keener on, on electoral reform than the than Labour Party was before. Uh, obviously, the Blair's government had the opportunity to do it and didn't. Um, however, these, these views are, seem to be held exclusively by parties in opposition. And as we saw with Labour, it doesn't necessarily stick to it when it comes into government, because if you've got into government, that means the system's got you there. And you might look and go, actually, we changed the system. We wouldn't be in government anymore or we wouldn't have a majority anymore or something like that. So the if you go back to the electoral system stuff, there, there is really strong arguments on both sides in terms of, of what should happen to it. One of the big bits in terms of whether there should be f f further reform is the referendum in 2011 suggested there was very, very little public support for, for altering the electoral system. Now, there's been a lot of elections since, so that might well have changed, but Again, until the, there is fur, further kind of active looking at this, and probably in, in, if, when you've got a government of a, uh, a different flavour, then that might be looked at in more detail. Fixed term parliaments. Uh, well, the Fixed Term Parliament Act is, is probably been um, one of the biggest failures of, of, of all the stuff in terms of uh, constitutional reform. It, it's just not worked. It, 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 it lasted uh, from it when it was created through to 2015, and it worked once. And then we had a 2017 election and a 2019 election. 
Boris Johnson in 2019 essentially shamed opposition parties into agreeing to an election. So legally they didn't have to, but he really shoot but storm through the press and in his speeches and things like that. So kind of going, right, I want an election. Well, you obviously scared of me. You don't think you can beat me. And, and completely kind of undermining the whole principle of the idea of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. It will get repealed, I'm sure, by our current government when it isn't dealing with the COVID stuff. And they've got time for more more ordinary business. And what it means is governments maintain a massive adv advantage because they get to decide when elections are because the Fixed Term Parliament Act hasn't worked. So again, you can argue very strongly this is an area that, that should be looked at. Uh, and the the difficulty, I think, is establishing it in a country that isn't used to having fixed terms. What was the idea of you'd mess around with term dates in America, for example, is is something that you, that people wouldn't even contemplate. The, the, and we've we've not had it, but we we tried it. It's not worked, and it does. The fact it doesn't work has, has continued to give advantage to governments, which is why we tend to have governments who win strings of elections in a row. Welsh devolution is, is a, a really interesting area. I mean, there, there is growing popularity of the idea of Welsh in independence. It's about 30, 31 percent in a recent poll. That might not sound very high, but it, 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 it's high in terms of um, Welsh support for it. Um, and th that kind of opinion polling might help push the idea for greater devolution in Wales. There is clearly a, an argument in terms of a consistency and making things more symmetrical that way the Welsh Parliament should hold the same powers as the Scottish Parliament and it's a long way short of that currently although it has recently been able to change its name and become the Welsh Parliament rather than the Welsh Assembly and that distinction I, I, I think is, is something that is going to be pushed on and that the Welsh Parliament will want and a lot of people in Wales will want the Welsh Parliament to gain the same kind of powers as Scotland. During the Covid crisis, Wales has demonstrated it, its ability to tread a slightly different path to England on a whole range of issues uh, in education and uh, it, to do with uh, lockdowns and, and, and local lockdowns and, and all kinds of things like that. This may well give the, the Welsh government and the Welsh people a taste for more. And so I think Welsh devolution is something that we could quite easily see extend further. Now, there are, there are fundamental differences between Wales and Scotland. Wales doesn't traditionally have a completely separate education system, doesn't have a separate legal system. Uh, and so, so there are some of these areas which might be more difficult for Wales to, to argue it should have over Scotland. Obviously, it's smaller, in terms, particularly in terms of population. And and maybe makes uh, can make lesser case in terms of, of, of financial issues, but the principle having been set up with Scotland, there's there, there seems to be an argument that Welsh devolution should follow the same path as Scottish devolution. In terms of Scottish devolution, well, the issues are even are even more controversial. So there are strong de demands in Scotland uh, for independence, and there's a growing feeling that there, there could well be an Indy Ref 2. Uh, and if there was an Indy Ref 2, that Scotland would vote for independence. The SNP have been doing really well. The, the, I'm making this video in um, February 2021. There's going to be um, elections in May 2021, we believe, and the SNP in, in, for the Scottish Parliament. And the SNP believes it will do really, really well. Scotland, particularly under Nicola Sturgeon, have, have demonstrated their ability to act differently to, to the rest of the UK, uh, particularly during the COVID crisis. <laughs> Lots of people in England have looked at um, Nicola Sturgeon's policies and ideas and gone, that seems like a good idea. One of them at various points of time seems to have been Boris Johnson. And we have seen things, particularly when we saw the uh, stuff over the exam results last year, where um, the Scottish government seemed to act first and then the uh, the British government seemed to go, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that too. Now, there is not an enormous amount of uh, wiggle room really left in terms of devolution with Scotland. We could move to what is referred to as Devo Max. Uh, and this is essentially when almost all power that, that can't... That, that that can't be seen as as a a, a whole Britain um, power. So things that the 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 only there are certain things that Westminster can only do, like military foreign policy things like that. As long as if, if the UK remains united, um, but kind of essentially all other areas, even more areas, could be devolved to Scotland. Now there has been a movement towards that since 97 and with those seen bits more continuing even under the Conservative government. So we could move to full blown Devo Max. 
and that might be something that is done to head off the demands for independence. As long as Scotland remains part of the UK, the whole West Lothian question remains, a Devo Max would actually make that worse rather than make that better. So there is this growing problem that if you give Scotland even further devolution, then the big question there says is, well, what are the Scottish MPs doing? Uh, what should the Scottish MPs be allowed to vote on and what should they not be allowed to vote on? And, and if you gave more and more areas to the Scottish government, your Scottish MPs if theoretically would be doing less and less in Parliament. So that's a difficult issue in terms of further devolution for Scotland. Now, the extent that devolution should come to England is, again, is a controversial one. I think this would make, again, it's something that would make a very good essay question, this one. Now, the arguments are saying that it should it, 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 are, I think, quite strong. So England is underrepresented compared to Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland because they have devolution and England doesn't. Uh, therefore, if I'm in Cardiff, I, I have a local council. I then have the, the Welsh Parliament. I then will have MPs and I'm represented in Westminster. If I'm in Edinburgh, then I, I uh, then I have a uh, I have local government. I then have the Scottish Parliament that represents me and then I'm represented down in Westminster. If I'm somewhere in England, um, then the chances are I will have a, a lo local government and then I'm represented in West Westminster. So there's a whole kind of jump there. Um, the West Lothian question, as I mentioned, in terms of Scottish devolution is a real issue as well. Now, there has been an attempt to, to try and make it, it's called evil, uh, uh, English law, uh, English votes uh, for English laws. And this idea that you can have this uh, this kind of grand committee in, in Parliament where there's a special vote for English MPs on, on laws that will only affect England to make sure that they can veto anything that's gone through, that would go through Parliament as a whole. This leads very much to Scottish and to some extent Welsh MPs becoming second class representatives because they, their, their vote isn't as important on certain issues. And now you could argue well, it shouldn't be because it's on issues that don't affect their constituents. But that starts to, to, to kind of spread the idea of, well, what happens? And that kind of comes into the counter arguments. And I'll look at those in, in a minute. But if you, you're looking at this from an English point of view, well, why should Scottish MPs vote on a law that only applies in England? Why should Welsh MPs vote on a law that only applies in England? Now, it's messy doing it in Westminster, so it would be far more straightforward to create an English parliament, and therefore English laws could be dealt with only by people who were elected by the English people. And that would give a, a degree of symmetry because you'd have a Welsh parliament, a Scottish parliament, an English parliament, and therefore on the island, then, then everybody's getting the same. And that symmetry, when that, that, that would give greater equality, and it means that people were only uh, discussing issues that, that involve their constituencies. Another part of this is money. Now, there's something called the Barnett formula. This goes back um, all the way back to the 1970s. And it, it, it's a form, formula that, that sets up the amount of public funding per head, per capita, that goes into England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And because England is wealthier than the other nations, the amount of money per head spent on English people is considerably lower than it is on those in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, this is something that, that you could argue that, that if you're going to devolve everything and, and different uh, countries within the United Kingdom, when you take their own responsibilities over these different bits, then maybe the Barnett formula should go. And therefore, the English money should be spent on, on the English and Welsh money should be spent on the Welsh and Scottish money should be spent on the Scottish. Um, and another interesting issue is an issue of identity. Now, whilst you have Plaid Cymru, and you have the SNP, who are kind of mainstream outlets for both kind of for both Welsh and Scottish nationalism, and you've got the nationalists uh, and, and parties in Northern Ireland as well. In terms of English nationalism, that's always been very much marginalised and pushed to the um, the, the fringes of, of British politics. And English nationalism is often viewed in a very very negative way, whilst nationalism of the other countries isn't. Now, that, you can argue, has caused potential problems and potential uh, difficulties in the past. And therefore, the idea of, of the English people being able to embrace Englishness um, it could be something that could be seen as a, a positive. Um, 
Now, the, the, another way of looking at it is rather than just looking at it as the English as a whole, you could look at it in terms of uh, regions, and there are places with very strong regional identities, so the north, um, Devon Cornwall, down in the southwest. So the, you could naturally form regional assemblies where they, they, there are uh, shared identities, shared ideas uh, within people in those areas, and they give them a degree of self-rule or independence through devolution. So that would seem as another way of doing it. If some of the counter arguments will say England is too big, we'll break it up into regions and then it's not so big. So the arguments against were saying, well, England shouldn't have its own parliament um, because the, the comparative wealth and size of England is, so it would completely dominate British politics. Uh, and then there would also be this big question left in terms of Westminster. So if we've got a separate English parliament, what does Westminster do? Um, what powers are going to go to this new English parliament and be taken away from Westminster? What stuff's going to stay in Westminster? The, the MPs in Westminster might be left with very little to talk about if loads of those issues have, have gone over to England. We might then, what happens if we get a clash between English government and the Westminster British government over who's in charge of something or or what should happen over something and that could cause a whole range of different uh, of difficulties and that would be an argument against creating an English Parliament so in, rather than doing that you could just look at uh, English votes for English laws and you could adapt it and change it and make it more secure and stronger and, and therefore solve the issue of the need for an English Parliament and the, the, the potential breakup of the UK all this could lead to and there's another bit, and this is a counter to what I was saying earlier about identity. It's a different way of looking at identity, where English people are more likely to see themselves as British than those in Scotland or Wales. Therefore, they already see the Westminster Parliament as their parliament. So they don't see the need for an English parliament. So it might be that there's a, a, a lack of support for the idea of an English parliament amongst the English people. There also might not actually be the support there for the regional ones. And we've, we've seen this where we've, there was an attempt to create a, um, a regional government in in the northeast now the northeast you would argue has a strong regional identity but it rejected the idea of devolution back in 2004 now again that's quite a long time ago and ideas might have changed in the regions and we've seen the city mayors and things like that so <clears throat> that you could do devolution in england but the, you might want to do it in a regional area if if the the attitude of the people has changed but while some areas have got strong regional identity, some other places don't. And it, again, for example, if you did the North West, well, are Manchester and Liverpool going to want to go in together or they want to go in separately? And, and then what happens in more in, in larger, more rural um, settings? So part of the argument against devolution in England is it, it would end up being really messy and really difficult um, to, to set up in terms of breaking it into smaller units. And if you do it as one big unit, it's too big and it fundamentally undermines uh, the basis of um, the British system and Westminster government. I hope that's been helpful for you and gone to, uh, given you some ideas on some of the debates and ideas around that. Uh, if it has been helpful, please hit the, uh, the, the like. If you have any questions or comments, then please leave those uh, below. If you haven't subscribed already, then please do. And there is plenty of my channel on all, for, all, all, all the various bits of uh, UK and US politics uh, and uh, lots of the different uh, ideologies. There's also a huge range of playlists on various bits of history as well. So thank you for watching uh, and hopefully uh, you'll have a look at some of my other videos. Thank you again.